Well, good morning, everyone, all of our campuses, all of you watching online, all of you here looking good on this uh, Palm Sunday. You know, every once in a while I get to travel around. I, I uh, help uh, a few churches around the nation, and this last weekend I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, great church there, but not as great as you, right? And so, so when you go away somewhere and you kind of think, oh, that's great, but man, I want to go home. You guys are awesome, all of our campuses, and um, man, I just want to say I love you. But Rick Gannon, how about Rick Gannon last weekend? He did awesome, man. He's one of my best friends in the world. So um, uh, a couple of things before I dive in. Um, Usually this is about the time I try to say something funny about RSVPs. Uh, No, I'm pretty ticked right now. We got 13 people coming to Easter services. (laughs) So if you could do me a favor, Easter at Hope.net. Um, not me a favor, not me. Um, th- a few things about this, seriously. A- and if you have our app, I went to our app yesterday just to see how easy it is to register or to RSVP. It's really easy. Or you can go to easteradhope.net and, and do this. But what, what it does is helps you when you come to service. Uh, last Easter, we had to put a, a ton of people in the optimal seating times, which is this service and the next service. So we have different times for our services next weekend, 9.45 and 11.15 uh, in the sense of these two services. And these are the two windows where most people want to come. So if you could go to another service, maybe that you and your family could attend, eight, we have an 8.15 or 8 o'clock, whatever it is, um, service. We have a 12-something. Um, there's a lot of people that like to come to this window. And last year, we had to put a ton of people in overflow. And then we, we lost room in overflow because there were so many people. And that's because last Easter we had a very low RSVP, okay? But I know you're smarter than that. And so Christmas Eve, here's what happened Christmas Eve. We didn't have to put one person in, in the overflow because you RSVP'd. So I know it's Easter and everybody wants to go to church on Sunday when Jesus rose. But can I tell you, it probably wasn't this coming Sunday, okay? <laughs> so... It doesn't matter, all right? He rose every day. All right, all right. So um, if you could help us, all of our campuses, all right, all of our campuses, it would help us to, for you to RSVP. Not only that, Good Friday. So this coming Friday, all of our campuses come together in, at this campus, Frisco East, and we have two services. So if you could RSVP for that, same place, um, it just helps us. We have nine people coming to that service. So if you could, um, you know, I'm kidding. We have a little bit more than that, but it would help us greatly. So uh, those two things. Then on top of that, okay, so RSVPs, please understand, it's very important. All right. Um, now we have a Holy Week devotional uh, for all of us to go through. If you're interested in that, leading up to uh, uh, Resurrection Weekend, <clears throat> you, you find that at Easter at Hope.net as well. Um, just every day, just different thoughts about uh, Holy Week and, and the days of Jesus. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. Let's do it together. Uh, today, we're coming to the end of our series, Who is Jesus? Over the last uh, several weeks, uh, Eric Sebastian, our campus pastor at McKinney, he started us off with uh, Jesus the teacher. And, and then we talked about Jesus the historical figure. Last week, Rick talked about Jesus, uh, uh, liar or Lord. Today, I want to talk about Jesus the king. And then next week, uh, Easter, we're going to talk about Jesus is the answer. But today, Jesus the king. Today is obviously Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And we're, we're going to get into that story and we're going to read that story in just a minute. But before we do, I want to give you the big idea for this message. Typically, if I have one of those, I save it to the end. You know, like I've said everything. Okay, so if you don't get anything I've said, here's the big idea for the week. Here's what I want to do. I want to give that to you now. In this whole message, you're going to hear this over and over. Here's the big idea for this message. Jesus is a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. I want you to hear this and let it sink in. Jesus is a different kind of king and he's building a different kind of kingdom. About ninth grade for me is when I was introduced, uh, probably before this, but when I got really interested in King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It's a legend. Um, 
in, in Great Britain or England that this benevolent king who would be different than any other king because the normal, I'm not saying every king, but, but the normal uh, mode of operation for the kings, it, regardless of country, didn't matter. Most of them weren't great leaders. Most of them, when I say leaders, they weren't great to the people. It was all about taxes. It was all about give me. It was all about serve me. It was all about fight for me. Um, the legend of King Arthur was different. And so about ninth grade, it started with some kind of movie I watched about King Arthur or sword or, you know, Excalibur or whatever. And, and so uh, I was like, man, uh, that's interesting. And so then I, I really took a liking and read some things and, and watched more movies on King Arthur and the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and the way that he led was not dictatorial. The way that he led was uh, with people around the table getting input and what's best for the people and so forth. Anyway, it took so much so that there was a time in which I thought maybe God might send me to England uh, as a missionary or a pastor there. And then I went and visited and then I thought, no, I'm not going to go there. It rains too much. If you're from England, we love you and we love England. We love the history, but it's too, too cold and too rainy. But anyway, if you think that the legend of King Arthur, or you think of one of the greatest leaders that you could think of politically or in, in a country uh, in our history, it doesn't compare to the kind of king that Jesus came to be. He was a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. He wasn't like anyone else. He wasn't like any other king. And so today, what I'd like to do is see, see how, how, what does that look like in Jesus' life? Because he didn't just say it, he modeled it. And then what does that mean for us? Because Jesus is a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom, and that kingdom that he's building, it, it is built through us. So not only is Jesus a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom, but he's asking us to be a different kind of people living a different kind of way in this world. So the thoughts that I have, three, just three thoughts about the, the different kind of king that Jesus is and then what he asks us to do in helping build his kingdom in a different kind of way. The first thought is, number one, <clears throat> a humble king. Now, I know most of us, you know, none of this is going to be earth-shattering in the sense that you've never heard it before, but I want to remind us <clears throat> in the kind of king that Jesus was, and, and we find this in the story of Palm Sunday, Mark chapter 11, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. Let's pick it up in Mark 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, <clears throat> they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the, the Lord needs it and we'll return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front of the door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said, well, Jesus told them just what Jesus told them to say, and, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. Now, before we go on, what has just happened in, in the, the time sequence of Jesus' ministry is he has just raised Lazarus from the dead. This was a big deal for some reason. Now, he did all kinds of miracles. But when he comes to the end here, and he raises Lazarus from the dead, after four days of being in the grave, this, and it was very close, the city where Lazarus was, very close to Jerusalem, there was a ton of talk. I mean, this was an, an incredible miracle that they were blown away, and everyone is buzzing about this. And so, if you're wondering why, you know, why would they, you know, I mean, what, what was the deal? What, what, what brought this on? Well, he had just performed this, this 
miracle, and people were very excited about this. Not only what Jesus taught was powerful, but his miracle of raising Lazarus was unbelievable. As, as you can imagine, I mean, that happened today. It would be, wow, that, that doesn't happen. So that's what's going on, okay? So now they're meeting him in Jerusalem as he's riding in, and they spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, praise God in highest heaven. Now, that, you know, you're going back to a humble king. Well, what does this have to do with a humble king? Well, I want you to note that in Rome, it was the custom for generals who had just come back from defeating an army, there would be a procession, and in that procession, the general would be riding on a horse, riding through. If you've ever been to Rome, uh, uh, there's the Colosseum over here, and then there's this street where, where all the main things were happening in, in that ancient time, and, and they would ride through on their horse with the army behind them, and, and it was a procession or a parade of victory. Jesus doesn't ride on a horse. He rides, he doesn't even ride on a donkey. He rides on the colt of a donkey. You ever seen a big man, I mean a big man, 300 plus pounds on a tiny little motorcycle? Have you ever seen that? Okay, that's the picture. I mean, you know, this is Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's just raised the dead, and he's riding on this tiny little Shetland kind of pony, a donkey's colt. They would notice this. And if they were paying attention, they would go to Zechariah. Zechariah, Old Testament prophet, says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is righteous and victorious, like a general riding through in a parade. Yet he is humble. Riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Jesus was not the kind of king first century Israel was expecting nor in the religious leader type of way were they wanting. Despite Old Testament specific prophecies, Jesus was a different kind of king. And, and, and it reminds me of Matthew 11 where Jesus says, he actually says these words, come to me, all of you who are weary and, and heavy laden or burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, my way, and I've talked about this scripture before. Take my yoke upon you. I will teach you because here's what Jesus says. I am gentle and humble at heart. A different kind of king building a different kind of people. And he asks us to do the same. He asks us to live in a way that is not positioned out of pride or arrogance or uh, power, but in humility. Luke chapter 14, let's go there. Just disciples, uh, James, two of the disciples, James and John, had just asked Jesus to, hey, can we sit on your right and left in the kingdom? You're important. We want to be important. We want to be in a position, would you let us sit right by you? And then the other disciples, uh, when Jesus noticed that they had come to dinner trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, so, so the, uh, uh, this is not the right story, but, but when Jesus is talking to his disciples, and I'll get there in a minute, he's just saying, hey, this is not the kind of kingdom that I'm building. 
And he tells them the story. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you is also invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed. Have you ever had nosebleed seats watching a baseball game? And nobody's sitting in the front, you know, the, 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 the bottom row. And you're kind of looking down. You're just like, hey, there's some seats right there. Let's go down there. And you go down there. And you sit there for an inning. And then the usher comes and says, hey, you got to move. And then you're embarrassed in front of all the people. That's the picture I get. I've never done that. But I've heard and seen <laughs> some people who have done that. And it's, you know, it's embarrassing. You'll be embarrassed. And you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the, instead, take the initiative. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table, and then when your host sees you, he will come and say, hey, friend, we have better places for you to sit or a better place for you to sit. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves, listen, for those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. A different... Let me just put it on the screen, and you're going to see this a lot. Jesus is a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom, and he's calling us to do the same. It, listen, it, this is an upside-down kingdom. It is the, the, the natural way is power. The natural way is position. The natural way is get ahead, be first, be great, turn it upside down, and it's, hey, humble yourselves humble yourselves before people, take the initiative to go to the lowest seat. I mean, this is not natural for any of us. Okay, just, I mean, just, look, just think of the grocery store and what line do you go in? You don't go to the longest line. You don't go to the person who has a cart full, you know, and, and by the way, if you're at a grocery store and you have your cart full at 5 or 5.30 or 6, you're shopping in the wrong time. People need to go quickly, and you just doing your weekly shopping at 5 or 6 at night? No, no, you do that at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> for all of our convenience. How many know what I'm talking about, right? You see that, and you're just like, really, today, right now? Okay, but anyway, it's not natural for us to do that, but that's what he says. And, and the reason is he's a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. That's what Palm Sunday helps us understand that he's not riding in on a white horse. He's, he's not riding in on a black stallion. He is riding on a baby donkey. Because he's a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. The second thought is, is that he is a servant king. Now, this is a lot like this, a servant king, but I want you to go to that scripture, Mark 10, and here's what Jesus says. Now, this is the part where Jesus was heard, heard that James and John had asked that they were indignant. Uh, the disciples had heard that James and John had asked to sit on his right and left. And they were like, what in the world? Who do you think you are? What are you doing? And they weren't indignant because of, of serving. They were indignant because they maybe wanted a seat. You know, and they were like, yeah, you're not going to sit there. So Jesus called them together and he says, you know that in, the, in this world or that rulers in this world, okay, so now we're at the, the, the regular, the natural way of leading, the natural way of living. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For, <clears throat> for the, here's what Jesus says about himself. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was the kind of king who serves his people rather than asking them to serve him. 
And, and this is an upside down kingdom. This is not natural. This is harder than it looks because we all, especially in the kingdom, we, we all want positions of authority. Can I just tell you, um, and, and I don't mean this as a slight to anybody who maybe has asked me in the past. It hadn't happened in years, but I used to get this a lot. Hey, how do you become an elder at Hope? Okay, when you ask that question, uh, I already know. Okay, you're not an elder. I already know. This, so, and it's not a bad question. It's just uh, the way that we operate here is that you don't become a leader because you have money. You don't become a leader because you have talent. You, you become a leader because you serve. Bottom line. You become a leader because you serve and, and you wash feet. In fact, the way that Jesus builds his kingdom, a, another example of this is in John 13. Last Supper, here's what he says. It was, it was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and, and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. And by the way, note that he washed Judas's feet. I don't have time to go into that thing, but, but the reality is it, it, Jesus is not just saying to us, be a servant. He's not just teaching us to be a servant. He's actually modeling. He gets up from the table. And by the way, in the first century, lowest of the low servant, servants were, were people who washed feet. And yet he gets up from the table and, and he gets a water jar and a, and a towel and he takes the disciples one by one and he washes their feet. Later on in the passage, here's what he says. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, this is the way Jesus asks us to live. You ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Later on in this, so I'm not reading it, but later on he goes in, this is the path to blessing. See, Jesus not only um, models servanthood, not only does he say, hey, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. In fact, here's what I want you to do. Take on the position of the lowest, and I'm going to wash your feet even the one who's going to betray me, and even the one who's going to deny me. And I'm going to wash your feet. We, we, isn't this true? We have trouble serving people we like sometimes, much less somebody who has betrayed us or going to betray us. And again, Jesus was a humble king. He was a servant king because he was a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. Now, this is, um, <clears throat> can I be honest? The other, I have not been honest up to this point. Uh, so <laughs> now, let me be honest. We're in a political season of division in our country, and we have been, and we always have been, by the way. Just, it is what it is. But in the kingdom, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to look at me. In the kingdom, Jesus is a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. Don't fall into the trap of the world's way of leading. Don't fall into the trap of the world's way of power. Jesus was a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. We, listen, we are his representatives. And it's vitally important 
that when those who are not following Jesus, not in the circle of the family of God or the or Christian uh, church or the Christianity, they're not following the Lord, they do not follow the Lord, it is vitally important that the way Jesus started this, the way Jesus uh, began his church, the way Jesus taught us to live is upside down from the way that is natural. And he says, I'm telling you, I want you to humble yourselves and then you can be exalted. I, I'm telling you, I want you to serve your way to greatness. In this world, leaders lord it over their people and flaunt their authority to those under them. But in our kingdom, in my kingdom, you wash feet. Even the feet of those you disagree with. Third, third, a, a, a sacrificial king. You have a humble king, you have a servant king, and then you have a sacrificial king. Now, this is probably the most dramatic. Kings send their armies to fight the battles. Kings ask their servants or their people to go before them in battle and give their lives for the cause of the kingdom. Jesus is a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. John chapter 19. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called Place of the Skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of of the Jews. Now, the religious leaders had begged Pilate not to do this, at least to add to it and to say, he said that he was king of the Jews. But Pilate just said no. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. <clears throat> Jesus, Pilate, the Roman governor of that area who had the authority to say yes or no, but because of the pressure of the, the Jewish people in that day, he said, no, okay, I'm going to give him to you to crucify him. I don't think he's guilty, but whatever you guys want to do. But I'm going to put over his head, king of the Jews. And this is what would happen. Let's read the rest of the story. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch and, and held it up to his lips. And when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In other words, he died. And while hanging on the cross, above him, king. Jesus is the kind of king who would lay down his life for his people. Humiliation. Some say that he would be naked I don't know if that's true or not, but it was a humiliating in the front of all the people. They would mock Jesus before they crucified him. They would whip Jesus before they crucified him. They would put a crown of thorns on his head, mocking him as king. Jesus was a different kind of king, building a different kind of people, a different kind of kingdom. And he calls us to have the same attitude. Philippians chapter 2, Paul's writing it this way. And he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Rather, or instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble, humble king position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name. And so this is the part, this is the part we hear most. 
God elevated him to the place, right, of highest honor, gave him the name that is above every name. I've heard that preached a hundred times, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, because that's what we'll preach. But go back on that verse one more time, would you? Just go back to the first part of that verse. No, nope, no, nope. yeah, there you go. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had, that even though he was God, he did not think of it, the equality with God is something to cling to. <clears throat> He said he would <clears throat> humble himself and he would sacrifice himself as the king. I mean, you know what's coming on the screen? You know, you know what's coming? Jesus is a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. We can, can we just say that together? Jesus is a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. We are the people he's building. We represent Jesus. So how does this play out practically in our lives? Well, it's not rocket science. It's how, how, do, we, how do we lead in our families? How do we lead in our business? <clears throat> it's not that you don't have competition in business, and it's not that you, that you don't, you know, sell things and try to make money and all this. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is the way that we do that is very different than the way of the world. And if you're in construction and you cheat people, that's not the kingdom. If you're in business and you cheat people, that's not the kingdom. The, the, the kingdom is upside down. If you, if you lie and cheat to get ahead, in the corporate ladder, that's not the kingdom. It's not, a, it's not wrong to get ahead. It's not wrong to make money. It's not wrong to have a business. Not wrong to put yourself out there. But, it, but the way in which we lead, listen, the reason this is so important is that people look at our lives and we have a fish on our card or we have a fish on our truck or a dove or, you know, cross we're representing Jesus, and when we lie and we cheat and we take advantage of and we, and we do all kinds of things that misrepresent the kingdom, can I tell you that's why we have lost a lot of influence in this nation? The reason we have lost influence is not because we don't have the right person in power. The reason we have lost influence is because we're not building a different kind of kingdom. We've fallen many times, not all the time, but many times we've fallen into the trap of this world. Grasping for power and grasping for the edge when in reality, Jesus calls us to do the exact opposite. Humility, service, sacrifice the way Jesus lived and the way Jesus calls us to live. Now, I understand this is not popular. I understand many would like me to say other things. But the reality is Jesus was a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. What kind of kingdom are you helping Jesus build? Now, we're entering Holy Week, and so here's what I think we should do. Let this settle in. Jesus was a humble king. Jesus was a servant king. Jesus was a sacrificial king. And in context of, of, of the tension of, of being in the world but not of the world, and this is a tension to manage because we're still here. We still live here, and we make money, and we do those things. It's not wrong. Again, it's not wrong to do those things. How we do those things is very important because we are ambassadors, we are representatives of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And eventually, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. What I'm, try what I'm trying to say is let's live a life where people will want to do this now, want to do that now rather than later. We, want to, we don't do that now. And the way that we live our lives, the way that we run our family, the way that we run our business, the way that we run our church, the way that we run our lives is upside down.
Because Jesus is a different kind of king building a different kind of people. So this Holy Week, let's settle in. Maybe turn off the news so much. Let's get our scripture out. Let's go through the devotional. Let's focus on Jesus and his life and his sacrifice. Let's come together on Good Friday and remember the death and the cost of Jesus. Let's come together next weekend on Resurrection Weekend and let's celebrate life and the resurrection. Because again, he's a different kind of king. He's not in the tomb. He's risen. He's risen. So the last question that I have for you, this has to do with the leadership of our heart, of our lives. And I would ask you the question, who is the king of your life? Jesus was a different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. And we have a a rule of leadership in our lives. It can either be you or it can be Jesus. Who is the king of your life? And And if that's not settled, if there is a question mark over, hmm. And I know none of us are perfect. Sometimes we lead ourselves and we get in the way. But, but I'm saying as a general rule, I'm talking about in the salvation sense. In other words, surrender sense. Is Jesus the king of your life? Or are you? Let's pray. Lord, <clears throat> I pray this all the time, almost every weekend. May your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. A different kind of king, building a different kind of kingdom. May your kingdom come. May your way, may your will be done rather than mine. And if there is a question as to who is the leader of my life, our lives, I pray that those in this room that need to make that decision to surrender to your leadership, to the the humble servant sacrificial king, Lord, I pray that by your spirit you would convict our hearts and that we would bow right now. We would confess right now that you are Lord, that you are king. Not only a king or the king, you are my king. And then for those of us who believe, may we represent you and your kingdom, the kingdom that you're building. May we do that well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.